Okay, good uh, afternoon, uh, everyone. I am Andrew Capetta, the Manager of Collection and Exhibition Programs at the Cleveland Museum of Art, and I'd like to welcome you to today's desktop dialogue. Uh, so while all of you are sort of making your way on here, or some of you are making your way on here, some of you are already here, um, use the time to familiarize yourself with the uh, chat interface, which is on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, to join the chat, just enter your name or any name that you prefer uh, and click to agree to the terms of service and the privacy policy. You can use this chat to make comments during the program at any time. If you have questions uh, or when you have questions, just pop them in the chat and we're going to turn to those questions for the last 10 to 15 minutes of the program. Below the screen is a list of web resources that we're going to reference uh, during what some of which we might reference during the program. So feel free to take a look now or later. Uh, the first that I will mention is the, I believe the last link there. It is a link to our survey. Uh, we'd like to learn more about you. So if you have time now or later, please feel free to fill it out. We greatly appreciate your participation because it helps us serve you, our audience. Uh, and lastly, this program is being recorded, so you can always watch it later on the CMA website or YouTube channel if you need to leave early, or if you have a friend or colleague that you think would be interested. Uh, and for today's program, uh, is called uh, Making and Meaning in MOLA Textiles. And we're going to discuss making and meaning in MOLAs, which are a key component of the traditional dress among indigenous Guna women in Panama. Uh, and the subject of the upcoming CMA exhibition, Fashioning Identity, Mola Textiles of Panama. Um, this is our first international desktop dialogue. I'm really excited about that. So if you can, let us know where you're coming from. I'm sure there's many folks in Northeast Ohio, but maybe we have some folks from near and far. It'd be great to see that. Uh, so for today's program, um, we have uh, Andrea Vasquez de Arte, who's the uh, Mary and Lee Carter Director's Research Fellow at CMA and the Curator of Fashioning Identity. Um, welcome, Andrea. It's great to have you. Thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here today. And just so everyone knows, Andrea is literally in the middle of installing the exhibition, and it's looking great. So it'll be up, I think, this weekend, um, which we're really excited about. Um, and we also have with us today Leonardo Perez Carreño, who's the museum guide from the Museo de la Mola in Panama City, Panama. Welcome, Leo. It's great to have you from Panama. Hi, Andrew, it's great to be here as well. Right. So we're gonna have a conversation for about 30 minutes and then we're gonna turn to some of your questions. So um, I thought I'd start off by asking you, Andrea, could you tell us more about this specific um, art form of the Mola, which is made by um, the, the Kuna people um, of Panama? What is a Mola exactly? Uh, and I think we have one of the Molas in the exhibition uh, on the screen right now to kind of tell us that. Sure. Uh, so the term mola means cloth or clothing, and it refers to both the, the rectangular hand-sewn textile panels, like the one shown here, as well as uh, it refers to the complete blouses that are made from these panels. The panels are made from layers of cotton fabric that have been meticulously cut and sewn to form dense, complex designs. These panels are made in pairs and attached to separate pieces of fabric that form the yoke and sleeves of the blouse. So you can see in, um, in, the, in the photo of the woman wearing a mola, uh, there she is, um, uh, you can see how she has her mola tucked into a cotton wraparound skirt. Um, she also wears a red and yellow headscarf and long strands of beads wrapped tightly around her arms and legs. And so you can see in the photo where the mola panel um, is uh, part of the mola blouse. Um, in the exhibition, Fashioning Identity, we show both isolated panels and complete mola blouses. And while the molas are arranged into small thematic groups around the gallery, the broader focus is really more on recognizing and appreciating the Kuna's own aesthetic perspe perspective. Um, the traditional Western perspective tends to privilege, privilege uh, iconography, and um, the tendency is to look for meaning primarily in the subject matter. But molas have a very broad range of subject matter, ranging from the abstract to the narrative, 
And that subject matter of a mola does not really tell us much about how molas work and how they convey meaning. Instead, this show considers the importance of process, fabrication technique, and the material construction of the object image to more understand how kuna molas function as such powerful symbols of kuna mm -hmm. cultural identity. Wonderful. Thank you. It's a really, um, I'm excited to see it in person. We've been looking at these objects, but they're so materially rich. And I love that you're bringing that idea to the table. Um, now, Leo, um, could you tell us a little bit more about the Museo de la Mola in Panama? And, and I think we're going to look at some images of the museum, which is, I think, recently opened and quite beautiful. Um, could you tell us a little bit just for a moment about the collection, but also how does the museum talk talk about or frame this very distinctive art form of the MOLA? Sure, sure, there's no problem. So as you're gonna learn uh, while we're talking about the information, the MOLA is an artistry that represents the indigenous, this indigenous people we have both in Panama and in Colombia. Now we have other elements, of course, that represents them, for example, this bracelet-like structures, we have the blouses, we have their skirt and such, but we tend to focus here in the museum, in the MOLA, that's this beautiful artistry that tends to take hours and hours of work through different installations we have on certain levels. And you seem even interactive, so people can understand them using their senses a little bit more about this topic. Have like a small introduction, to this beautiful world that's yet to be discovered fully. Right, and what are the sort of the main, I know there's like kind of six sort of roles, right, that, that sort of molas play. What are those? I think we're gonna use these to sort of uh, frame some of our conversation here. Yeah, sure. Now, the, to understand the mola, we need to understand its historical and cultural background. And to understand that specifically, we need to understand the different functionalities. How are they used? Now, there's a lot of functionalities, but we mainly focus on around six different functionalities. We tend to say at the first exhibition, once you enter, that the mola is not only a beautiful blouse, it's actually other things as well. It's an element of communication. It's an element of protection, which is main functionality. It's an element of, it, uh, of exchanges, of, it's a merchandise. It's an element mm -hmm. to harmonize or camouflage with your surroundings. It's a way of people to pass down information from generation to generation, and even to understand complex ideas and structures, not only of the culture of the community, talking about beliefs or things of everyday life, but things that are happening in the present and things that may happen in the future. So we tend to show people not only this information through the molas, but how can they perceive it in the easiest way possible. Right. And, and of course, these are we've been talking about the Kuna people that, that make these um, objects. We're going to learn a little bit more about that, that process. But could you just tell us briefly about, about them and sort of where they live in Panama? Sure, sure. Now, this specific community is one of seven different indigenous communities we possess in Panama. Now, in the case of these communities, we, they tend to reside on their indigenous reservations that are mainly on the southern part of Panama and on the northern, mainly on the southern part. Now, in the case of the Kuna community, you can find them only in two countries throughout the world, both in Panama and in Colombia but 97 percent of the total population resides in our territory specifically as you can see in the map on their reservation known as the comarca cunayala and three percent of the community is located in colombia now in the case of their territory of course we have a beautiful archipelago distributed uh, through the line that marks the caribbean sea now, even though they have both land and islands, they tend to use the islands as kind of like a household, a place where they reside in, and they tend to use uh, the land specifically for agriculture, hunting, and exchanging goods, as you may see on the map. Hey, Leo, can you tell us a little more about what kind of relationship the Museo de la Mola has with uh, the Kuna people? Sure, there's no problem. 
Now, because of the fact that the mola is an element of cultural expression, it's the main symbol of the community. Usually when artists or people that are outside of the community want to represent this, maybe to represent Panama or to represent the different indigenous communities that we reside in, they need to ask permission to the Kuna Congress that are the main political leaders of the community. Now, in our case, even though we do not show the whole history of their culture and everything that represents them, we only use the mola, we had to sign an agreement with the Kuna Congress so they can allow us the opportunity to be kind of like a secondary line or an indirect way for people to understand more about them. So we are kind of like an indirect representation, but still we do not represent them. As I mentioned earlier, we're just kind of, a, kind of like a small summary of everything that they have to offer so that people can go directly into the Comorca, go directly to them and learn more about this through them directly. No, thanks, Andrea. That's a wonderful sort of clarification of that relationship because that's quite important, right? Mm -hmm. um, as stewards of this, you know this culture's particular art form um, and and the responsibility you take you take on. Now, Leah, I have, I have one more question before we move on to like looking closely at molas, and that's you know in certain societies there are really clear divisions of labor. Certain people, whether of a specific gender identity or a social class or caste, make certain things. Um, who makes molas in the Kuna society? And I see there's a question quickly from Joanne. Um, the, 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 we write the word Kuna with a G, G-U-N-A, though it is often pronounced with a more of a K sound, if that makes sense. So, um, but yeah, Leo, so yeah, who makes um, molas? Okay, uh, the mola can be made both by men or women, but it's mainly made by women because the mola is their dressing, is what they tend to wear. Now, if we base ourselves as to why do they need to make the mola, why usually are the women in the community the ones that make the molas and wear them, we will have to say that they tend to wear the molas because, as I mentioned earlier, one of the functionalities of the mola is to protect the wearer. And women tend to need more protection than men, not because of the fact that they are kind of considered weak on their social construct, but because of the fact that they are the ones that have a stronger connection to the universe that surrounds us, both physically speaking and spiritually speaking. And because of this, they tend to interact way more with negative spirits that surround them. So for them to protect themselves, they make the molas and they wear them directly, kind of like an armor, and they're the warriors inside the community. Hmm. Thank you for clarifying that. Great. And then, Andrea, what did you find out specifically about that sort of mola making process among among the sort of women in the community? We're looking at a great image of some mola makers here. And could you kind of tell us more about the construction, the materials, and and techniques? Sure. Um, so, uh, although women make their own molas primarily for their own use and wear, as Leo said. Um, they often get together with close friends and family to sew molas in groups, uh, like you see here in this photo. Um, working together like this, they are able to critique each other's work. Um, they can comment on a mola's composition, craft, and level of difficulty. Um, since they're all uh, experienced at making them, it's very easy for them to see when a technique has been used that's difficult to execute. Um, in this way, the MOLA production process builds social and, fami and familial relationships. Um, it reinforces aesthetic values. And uh, in this way, it's also a form of cultural reproduction. Uh, MOLA's, uh, MOLA trends come and go, and each generation has their own approach to style. Um, but the integrity of the MOLA panel persists very strongly through these changes. Um, this approach to artistic production is highly social and quite distinct from um, the Western narrative of art being made by uh, the creative genius working in isolation. Um, in terms of construction, um, looking at an image of, uh, of a mola, um, if we can look at an image of a mola to look closer at its construction, um, Molas are made entirely from imported materials, cotton, fabric, thread, needles, 
Um, and more recently, synthetic fabrics are used for the yoke and sleeves. So their production is really tied to the international market. The Kuna have a long history of trading with outsiders, dating back to the colonial era when they first migrated to the Caribbean coast. Um, when they began making molas, uh, probably near the end of the 19th century, they developed a special type of reverse applique to transcribe mm. these complex patterns into a fabric medium. So here you see the front and back of a panel made from two layers of cotton fabric, black and white. And you can see how the entire design is stitched right into the fabric, all using reverse applique, except for the little red and yellow eyes that you see in the birds. Um, reverse applique was the first method that was developed and used, and then surface applique, uh, which is used for the eyes, and then um, embroidery comes in kind of later to further embellish the molas. Um, we can talk a little bit about the process of making a mola as well um, to look at more, to better understand this, the, the process of surface, uh, of, re of reverse applique. So um, in this first image, you see the um, two layers of fabric are, are stitched together, orange over black, and you can see just very faintly um, the, uh, the artist has drawn in pencil the, uh, the outlines of three main shapes that are gonna be the, the principal design of the mola. Very difficult to see, but it's just a, a guiding line. Um, sometimes they even skip this step and go right into cutting the fabric. Um, mm -hmm. In the next image, um, you can see where they have um, basted the fabric together um, within the, the, the shapes and they've cut out um, all around the outline of the shapes. Um, here mm -hmm. they've used a triangular, they've cut not just in a straight line, but they're cutting little triangles to further embellish. And this is a very laborious technique. It's called ada ada or uh, dientes, um, which means teeth in Spanish. Um, and um, so they're making the, the outline and they're cutting away the orange fabric, sewing the orange underneath to show the black fabric that's underneath. But they keep the orange part um, situated in place and you'll see how that builds kind of layers and outlines uh, in the next image. So here, the start, now this is where it starts to get really complex. Oh <laughs> um, they've added um, another layer of green fabric um, over top the black, just within those main three shapes. And then the whole piece, um, uh, another uh, full layer of maroon fabric has been overlaid across the top. And they've cut out the shapes, but they maintain the outline um, of, of those three main forms to kind of reemphasize that, that outlining. And it's also building layers. So when you see these in person, they're very three-dimensional. Um, you're seeing the the red over orange over black and the uh, the the or the maroon rather um and then within the mm -hmm. shapes you have the maroon over green over black and then you've got these little tiny pieces of scrap fabric that are laid on top in, in a, a whole array of bright colors um, these are then going to be a uh, surface appliqued on top of the black and in the next slide, we can see how they get all nicely tucked in and sewn down on top of the black. Mm -hmm. And then more of that maroon fabric is appliqued okay. on top of those colored pieces um, with a little bit of embroidery uh, finishing on top of that. Um, so again, you have that maroon layer surface sitting on top with all these layers um, building underneath it. And then the, the final step is to fill in the background with these filler elements. Here we see little triangles called wawa naled. Um, these are little tiny triangles that each have to be cut out uh, as um, nips and they cut down into the black fabric and then little uh, colored pips are sewn on top of the black fabric so that you get these beautifully um, vibrant uh, triangles outlined very crisply mm -hmm. in black. So it's the, the final yeah. product is really stunning, very three-dimensional, very, um, uh, very yeah. complex. No, yeah. that's incredible. Thank you. And thank you to the Museo de la Mola for these images. These are there from their uh, kind of process. Uh, this is how they show the sort of mola-making process to their public. So it's great to see it here. Um, 
Uh, Leo, that brings me to a question about, you know, Andrea really sort of laid out like how complex this is. I think everyone is on, seeing that really clearly. Um, I'm curious if there's a specific reason why such an amount of time and attention is paid to manufacturing this kind of fabric panel, right, which is also partially tucked into the waist, which is interesting, right? Is there a, a, a cultural significance to this sort of this complex layering? Is there a deeper meaning there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what we tend to explain here in the museum after the process of making is that behind the process, there's a deeper meaning. Plus, there's a deeper functionality at the same time. Now, we tend to use the mola as for people to understand that the way they perceive everything that surrounds them is as complex as making a mola. Why? Well, to understand this, we need to understand how their universe and how they perceive everything that surrounds them. And as you can see on the map, this complex structure tends to represent the universe as a whole. Now, it's not as simple as it sounds. To understand this, you need to imagine the world or the universe as if you're studying the Earth from the nucleus or the center up to space up to get the galaxy, up to the universe. Now, if you see directly the structure we have right here, you could say that the eye and all the area that's in this dark red color would represent the center of our planet. That is an area called the infraworld that's divided in different layers. After this specific space, it comes the plane of existence where we're at called the middle world. That's the orange space you can see right here. And then beyond that, it's all the yellow space with the S known as the super world. That's the world beyond our reach. That's divided an infinite amount of layers. Now, it is said that even though you, to understand this, you need to, uh, to compare it to the structure of the world. But physically speaking, we're talking about different planes of existence that are coexisting between each other as if we we're talking about parallel dimensions. Mm -hmm. And like parallel dimensions, there are other versions of ourselves on the other planes of existence. Now, here's the tricky part. The only living, the only organisms that can travel between them are entities with a strong sense of power. For example, spirits could be evil, could be good. And besides the spirits, we have what we call the spiritual leader of the community known as the Nele that tends to be more female than males. And what they tend to do is that they use the mola as a way of teaching the younger generation about the structure of the universe. And they tend to uh, teach the people that this is a really dangerous journey because in each layer or plane of existence, there are different tests that only one with a stronger sense of spirituality such as the spiritual leader can go to to acquire information or even to have visions of the future to protect the community like it's it's something we can talk about it for hours it's a really beautiful yeah, topic no. well it's a you know it's a it's a it's a sort of a very a, a, a very complex you know as most sort of belief or religious practice spiritual practices are it's not so easy to explain right uh, but i love the way that the multi multiple layers right really sort of reflect that mole and i think of of this idea of the interpenetration of the of them right the fact that they're you know kind of intermingle reminds me of like the stitch right um and also just going through that process andrea reminded me of it too right how these different layers reveal and you see all of them almost at the same time which is kind of um fascinating now leo you mentioned earlier that molas are used for protection um i want to talk more about that and i think you have a wonderful mola from your uh, from your collection at Mumo uh, to explain that, like how how this idea of protection maybe connects to the design, right, of the mola. Well, to understand the functionality of protection, we need to understand the different tales or the different mythology that exists within the community. Now, in the case of the patterns themselves, a they come from a tale known as the tale of the Najajirai. Now, <clears throat> according to the history, thousands of years in the past, there were different spiritual leaders inside the community. 
and they said that for them to acquire spiritual information and enlightenment, they need to pass through different layers or planes of existence and pass the tests that were on the inside. Once the tests were passed, they were acquire information and go to the next level. Now, what happened? There was a lot of difficulties on certain levels that no man could pass. Like the tests were almost impossible and they either got trapped under that plane of existence or they went back again to ours. And what happens is that a young woman was chosen for this job, the first spiritual leader female known as Najirai. And what she did is that she traveled to the different planes of existence and easily passed every test possible, going even beyond what was imagined by any human at, at the era. And once the god and goddesses of the Kuna universe saw that, they deemed her worthy of the great power of the infinite patterns. And they give this to her as a gift, patterns that had no beginning nor no end. So what she did is that she took this information, she came back to her plane of existence, the middle world, and she taught this to the people of the community, especially the women that were the ones that were most more vulnerable because they have a stronger power and a stronger connection to the universe. And at first, they start taking these patterns of different shapes, different sizes on the skin as kind of like a temporary tattoo made of natural inks. But later on, they start applying them to the, their clothing. And what happens was that it didn't have the same effect because it was just one layer. So what they did to create this infinite loop, visual loophole is that they started a plane and working with conscious of colors to create this three-dimensional structures. Now what happens? These three-dimensional structures create like this spiritual labyrinth structure that in theory traps evil spirits and evil entities that surround them on the inside of the patterns so they could be there forever. And that's a way for them to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. That's why they have those patterns not only in the mola, talking about the blouse, but either even in other parts of their clothing, for example, the weenies that are the bracelet-like structures and even the veil that covers their hair. Hmm. That's really amazing. It was reminding me of, of, in my own way, like my own experiences of like caution tape and, you know, hazard imagery, you know, like the yellow and black stripes and how that contrast is really effective. Now, I know we have only a few minutes left, but Andrea, I wanted to ask you quickly, how does this idea relate to how it is worn as a garment? And I think we're looking right now at a reminder of where these are worn. I know you had some thoughts about that as well. Sure. Well, wow, this is such a stunning mola, I have to say. And the precision required to make this mola really vibrate is remarkable. Um, we need to remember, though, like you said, that these are not made to hang flat on the wall, but be worn on the body um, and therefore work together with the body. Um, here you can see, again, the mola. Uh, panel sits on the lower torso of the body covering from the sternum to the belly and part of the mola panel is concealed under the wrap skirt. Um, and remember also that there are two panels, one on the front and one on the back, really sandwiching the body between them. So the panels effectively envelop a woman's uh, reproductive organs, especially her womb, where the amniotic sac acts as yet another layer of protection for a developing baby. Um, and that actually makes me wonder a little bit about the men. Um, Leo, you talked about men uh, also needing some kind of protection, um, but since the women only wear molas, um, you know, what, what do the men use to protect their bodies? Well, in the case of the men, uh, what's made nowadays is that what they tend to do is that they take their shirts and they put like tiny mola patterns, the patterns specifically, at the borders of the neck and at the end of the sleeves. They tend to have a long, long sleeve shirt. And besides that, what they tend to use to protect themselves is a small item known as akebandur that has the shape kind of like an ar humanoid arrow. And they tend to wear it either as an item on their pockets of their pants or, as you can see right here, just to give you an example, as a necklace. Now, here's the thing. They, their way of not 
it's showing that they have kind of like a strong amulet of protection to their, their enemies or even to their neighbors is that they tend to take all these objects and they tend to hide it underneath their clothing. And that's a way even to, to like not warn evil spirits so that they can attack them. Because it is said that this amulet that tends to be made at, by hand by the spiritual leader, it's an amulet that invokes a protective spirit that can either warn you or attack you directly if you try to attack you back. And of course, they have other elements of protection that tends to be used depending on if it's an individual, if it's a family, or it's if it's for the whole community as a whole. And not only, of course, depending on the size, but depending on the shape as well and the design as well. Hmm. Uh, thank you, Angie. That's a really great question to think uh, to ask. Like, what what is used for you know men in this culture? Now, I know we 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 I want to get to we want to get to some questions, but maybe we can just show um, one last uh, work, and that's actually going to be Sean. If we could show the Santa Claus Mola, um, because I feel like we ha uh, it'd be great to just end with something about. Um, you know, this, this idea uh, where, you know, we're looking at a lot of the meaning, right, uh, of the sort of designs, especially in the Labyrinth Mola. Um, but, you know, the, but we also see uh, examples where the Kuna people are incorporating imagery uh, that, you know, is uh, or has origins outside, right, uh, Kuniala. Um, and I'd like to ask you, Andrea, first, and Leo, also feel free to jump in, like, what is the you know, why choose this this motif of, of Santa Claus? Is it is it maybe a very simple reason, um, or um, you know, how how do we how do you read this imagery, or do you not, uh, Andrea? Sure. Um, well, this is a great example of how Kuna women appropriate other cultures into their own artistic practice, and it highlights the difference between finding meaning by identifying the subject in an image versus finding meaning in how the image is composed and constructed. We can see that the figure is a representation of Santa Claus by the pointy hat, the white beard, the belt and buckle, uh, the belt buckle and the boots, and of course, the sacks of toys. But recognizing the figures as images of Santa Claus doesn't really tell us anything about how this mola signifies Kuna identity. Um, instead, we need to focus on how the image is constructed three-dimensionally in multiple layers of fabric, in the choice and combination of colors and patterns, and most importantly, in the doubling of the Santa Claus persona. Um, and that's how we really see that this is a thoroughly Kuna work. Um, everything in the Kuna universe has that has a spiritual double. So we see a lot of doubling of patterns and figures in Kuna molas. And if you look closely, they are not exactly the same because the toys in their sacks are different. And this is so typical of how Kuna art expresses duplicity by pairing images that are almost but not quite the same. So it's a very, very Kuna image. Really fascinating. And, and Leo, do you have anything you'd like to add Yeah, about this? about the use of maybe, you know, um, um, these this sort of imagery motifs from sort of uh, outside uh, Kuniala? Well, in my experience is sometimes uh, the artists, the Kuna artists, tend to take these topics of the outside world or the modern world so that they could like confront it directly and say, I'm not afraid of you. Sometimes, in some cases. In others, as I explained before, the mola has a lot of functionalities. One of the most beautiful ones we tend to describe is that the mola has an element of harmony that helps you not only uh, kind of like mold down and harmonize with your surroundings, but camouflage with everything that you have around you. That's why usually the molas that are worn as a blouse they tend to have like the shapes of nature. So sometimes what the artists tend to do is that they tend to take these topics of the modern world, place it on themselves so they can harmonize with the modern world without losing, of course, aspects of their culture. It's kind of like mixing up the old with the new. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's a really, a really nice way of thinking about it, right? Because um, this looks to me like a mola, right? It does not remind me of any stylistically of, of any kind of, um, you know, specific Christmas decoration that I'm, you know, 
have experienced in my life. So there are some wonderful actually comments about there's lots of resonances that people are seeing with uh, other sort of um, sort of uh, different sort of folk embroidery traditions from across the world. Um, I think it might be um, good to maybe take some questions. Does that sound good, Andrea and Leo? Mm -hmm. Sounds so, good. So yeah, audience, feel free to pop in more questions. We already have a bunch. I think we have one in here um, that my colleague has popped in and from LWS Petsnik. Um, says, reminds me of military ar armor, uh, gambesons, and I might be pronouncing that incorrectly, and I apologize if I am. Is there any historical connection to Spanish explorers with the basic technique? Um, are there any any thoughts about that? Um, maybe, Leo, if you want to start the, us off with that, if you know any connections to um, Well, there there are several theories well as you may know in the history of panama in our case we were a spanish colony now what happens during a period of time is that they were forcing the indigenous community to have kind of like a more more european approach to the way they behave to the way they dress now one of the theories that historians have told us about and have explained to us is that the usage of clothing came specifically from that. The basic, at least, the first generation of Mola, which was kind of like a really long dress, came from some kind of version of the dressing of Spanish ladies, specifically Spanish people. But later on, for them to appropriate themselves of this object that used to represent themselves, they started modifying little by little different aspects of it. And little by little, the mola, the mola has changed a lot through the years. The little by little, the mola started becoming more of a blouse rather than a dress. And nowadays, I would dare to say that it's more of a corset rather than a big bunch of blouse. And the same goes on with other aspects. Like the origin, I would dare to say that of course, it has Spanish influence, but even though it has Spanish influence, it, is, it was not necessarily made by them. It was mm -hmm. kind of like inspired, or it was just a method of survival at, the, at the, that specific period of time. Mm -hmm. Kind of conforming to those sort of, um, yeah, those mores. Um, um, Andrew, maybe this is a good question for you. Elizabeth Hogue, says, so these objects have a history dating to dating to the 19th century. Do they have a longer historical, you know, any historical or longer historical archaeological associations? And maybe, um, you know, uh, Leo's question sort of answered that, but would you, is there anything that you'd like to add to that? Or, or could you answer with this sure. question? Um, so the unfortunate uh, fact is that there aren't really any photographs of particularly of Kuna women before the turn of the 20th century. So it's we don't really know for sure. Um, the Kuna themselves originated not on the coast, but more inland um, in that uh, uh, space between Panama and Colombia in, the, in this very dense jungle there. And um, clothing is not really uh, very practical in that kind of climate. So the, um, the Kuna people kind of pre-colonization, they didn't really wear uh, much of any clothing. Um, as Leo mentioned, they did body painting instead, and that's really how they worked with these uh, protective um, patterns and designs. So they're moved to the coast, which was a new climate. Now there's sun, there's wind, there's storms, and they're all of a sudden now really engaging um, in a lot of trade with um, colonists all over the Caribbean. So that's really what instigated the move towards wearing clothing. Um, and, and they had to really kind of invent it from, you know, I mean, they, they were working with, um, you know, Spanish clothing uh, as, as, a, as, a, um, uh, as a foundation, but really, really looking for a way to kind of make something that was more their own. Okay. And actually, there's a question in the chat, I think it's a good follow-up maybe for you, Andrea. Um, uh, Joanne asks, do they use new fabric or old fabric that has meaning for them? And she's thinking particularly of quilts. Um, I think this is a good, you know, mm. we have the Santa Claus Mola, you know, uh, in our, we're looking at it now. Maybe you'll be looking at it soon too out there. Yeah. Um, sure. 
Um, well, I think when they make the molas, they're they're starting with new fabric. Um, so fabric deteriorates very easily and quickly in the in the kind of climate um, of of the Caribbean coast. Um, that sun, that wind, uh, you know, you you want uh, you want to start with good sturdy fabric. The panels are always made out of cotton because that's really what you need that that um, strong sturdy fabric. The the sleeves and the that bottom kind of um, border can be made really out of anything. And I think it's just you know, uh, you see the real kind of love of color and pattern and, you know, um, real pleasure in combining different colors and patterns and really creating these exciting pieces. Um, I don't know if maybe sometimes they do maybe uh, use, use materials that are significant, but um, material, fabric material is not really going to be the kind of thing you can like pass down to generations. It's just not going to last very long. Yeah, Leo, is there anything you'd like to add to that question before we tackle one or two more? Mm, well, can I, what can I add? The, well, the fact that the mola is an element that tends to take, of course, as I told you, hours. Now, depending on how you make it, it will depend as well how long it will last. And depending, of course, the amount of layers, because the minimum amount of layers a mola can have of textiles is around two, and the maximum, depends on artists, 13, 14. I cannot talk about maybe the molas in general, but in the case of the ones we have here in our museum, they, they are molas that are in really good conditions that have around 70, 60, 80 years of age, like, they they last a lot of time and it's because of the fact that they were made to last that long because of the amount of layers they possess and it's something really hard to do because the climate here the humidity and as, as you mentioned the climate in the case of the caribbean for clothing and textiles they tend to last not long maybe around 10 years or so before the clothing rips apart completely but because of the fact that they tend to do this a lot and they tend to take care of their clothing, of their molas, the molas tend to last, tend to last way longer than regular clothing as well. I think we have time for one more question. We have a great one from Mary um, that asks, how often were they political? And Mary shares that she has a mola mm -hmm. that she brought back. Um, in, I'm assuming from Panama in 1971, that was a political sign for a candidate. I know there are such things, you know, um, in collections. Um, and I think there might be, is, mm -hmm. I think there's a political mole or two in the exhibition, if I'm correct, Andrea. Um, how often were they political? Um, that's a very good question. And we do have a couple of political molas in the exhibition. Um, so women, uh, they gained the right to vote in the 1940s. Um, that was when Panama granted universal suffrage. So um, it was around that time uh, after they, they had the right to vote um, that political molas kind of come onto the scene. You start to see them in the, in the 50s and 60s predominantly is, uh, is when you see um, these molas. And then um, they, they taper off because of the, um, some political uh, developments that I'm sure um, uh, Leo can maybe uh, elaborate on um, uh, that that basically um, eliminate uh, political parties from the system. So then you, they kind of disappear. Um, the mm -hmm. ones that we have in our exhibition are actually from the mid 1980s, which is unusual. Um, that was when uh, elections kind of picked up again, and you do see um, uh, some some political molas that are in support of certain parties um, uh, popping up again, but not, I don't think quite as much as they were in the, in the earlier decades. Um, Leo, what, can you add to that any? Well, uh, the molas, uh, they, as I mentioned earlier, they tend to be a mechanism of communication, but they tend to be used as a political statement as well, depending on what the artist wants. It tends to be a lot of the times because of that. In the case of the molas we have here, they have a political topic. They were made specifically to mock 
the president at the time because he was doing maybe some kind of really bad thing or a really bad job in the case of what they were doing with their community. So it sometimes is to mock, but other times is to express to what they believe a, the a president represents, maybe a cow or maybe even a lizard represented that it's a snake. Like there's a lot of ways. Hmm. No, that, that, that's Mainly really great. I mean, you know, hmm. Yeah, well, it's, it's like anything, right? It doesn't, it doesn't, it, it has a multiplicity of meaning because you're dealing with, um, well, you're also dealing with how many dozens, if not hundreds, maybe thousands of artists, each with their own, right, sort of ideas and preferences and choices, right, which is really exciting. Um, yeah. So I want to, we have to wrap up now. We could talk for days, as everyone as everyone knows, which is wonderful. <laughs> um, I want to thank you so much. No, because the, the topic is so fascinating um, and they're so rich. Uh, and Andrea, I want to thank you so much. I look forward to seeing the exhibition. All of you in Cleveland or in driving distance, you know, you're welcome to come to CMA and see it safely. It'll be up for quite some time. So thank you, Andrea. Mm -hmm. um, and thank yeah, you so uh, much, Leo, from, from for joining us. Um, it's great to, it's been great to have you. Um, yeah. So Desktop Dialogues uh, has been uh, made possible in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, Exploring the Human Endeavor. Um, and I'm gonna, uh, actually my colleague Kijo Lee is here to share some information about the Next, the upcoming Close Looking at a Distance program, which is also um, about the MOLA exhibition. Kijo, could you tell us more about that program? Oh, I think you're muted, Kijo. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea and Leo and Andrew for that fascinating conversation. And I'd like to invite you to join Andrea and me on Wednesday, December 9th at noon to take a deeper dive into some examples of MOLA and really consider how um, these women from this uh, um, matriarchal society are literally stitching their world. Um, and so we will think about how their techniques of applique and reverse applique um, uh, connect to their complex uh, cosmology or understandings of the universe and the terrestrial world. Um, so we look forward to seeing you then. Great, and that's just a reminder to everybody, we're, Kijo and I and our, our whole production team that are not visible are gonna take a couple weeks off because of the holiday. So we'll be back on December 9th um, with CLAD, with Close Looking Distance. And also that evening, uh, we're gonna have a, another program that uh, is sort of in honor of the new CMA exhibition, Second Careers, Two Tributaries in African Art. Um, tickets for that program are available on cma.org. It's called Memory, Memory, Materiality, and Transformation, Contemporary Artists in African Traditions. It should be a great conversation between some contemporary artists and um, uh, uh, the curator of the exhibition. Um, so please uh, look for more information about that. Uh, if you'd like to explore more works in our collection, visit CMA Collection online. If we didn't get to your questions during the program, or if you have more, you can always go to Artlens Ask on the CMA website and someone will get back to you. Links for both of those are down below, as well as a link to um, more information about the exhibition um, of, about MOLAs that's up, opening up this weekend at CMA. Um, thank you all and have a great day. Bye.